Good evening. Today we are going to fly to a different country, to Canada, one of my favorite universities. And it is a favorite, favorite university because one of my, I would say, um, mentor lives there. And I had a hard time trying to get him to our program. And uh, his name is Dr. Ante Pajin. He is one of the very active members of International Brain Research Organization. And I'm sure you'll enjoy this journey to Canada and then we'll be back to India with, and to other countries. You viewers belong to different countries. I can assure you will love this uh, presentation. And I'm more than excited to be uh, with Ante Pajin, who is a faculty of medicine at McGill University. He's a professor at the Dean's Office, Faculty of Medicine. He has completed MD from the University of Zagreb, Croatia, another beautiful country. And he has served as professor at McGill University, Department of Pharmacology and Therapeutics from 1976. His primary research interests include neuroscience, information technology, and knowledge translation in biomedicine, with a particular interest in developing areas. He is active in national, international, professional, and public organizations, and is one of the active members of International Brain Research Organization. And viewers, uh, while we have been deliberating on these last 150 days on a variety of issues and topics, and as you may know, and our journal, Integrative Medicine Case Report, uh, seeks to bridge the gap between the East and the West in terms of therapies of modern medicine and those that belong to the alternative category based on evidence, uh, you can agree with me that all my efforts in the last 150 days, rather our efforts in the, in the last 150 days has been to integrate the different disciplines for a singular purpose of patient well-being, to be patient-centric. And there's no authority better than Dr. Ante Pajan who does this admiringly well. In fact, he's been an inspiration for me to undertake this journey. Uh, since I got trained in IBRO, International Brain Research Organization workshops, not one, not two, three. And I think on two of them, he was always there, uh, walking through them, I've been learning through him. And I therefore thought that he, uh, you should also experience uh, him talk about subjects. And look at the beautiful slides he has, you can all see that bridging the separation between care, cure, control, and community. He's talking of integration, I suspect, but the way he puts it, so he not only brings in the neuroscience, the, phys the physician's point of view, the patient's point of, point of view, but more importantly, a philosophical point of view, which is lacking in most of uh, so-called investigators and scientists and physicians, and what, no matter what you call them. So here you are with Dr. Ante Pajan, and I'll switch off my video and you're all with him. Dr. Ante, welcome to this program and we are all eyes and ears to hear, to, to see what you have to tell us and to hear what you have to share with us. Welcome to India and to other countries. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Anand. Uh, shall I call you Akshay as we always do? Sure. Uh, it is my great pleasure to be with you. I'm uh, uh, coming as a real ignorant about uh, many of these alternative things that you have been doing. However, I'm a very strong believer in integration of different types of knowledge that human race has collected and that somewhere between our interaction there is a better way to the brighter future. Uh, we are all now under great uh, impression of how fragile our environment is being affected by COVID-19. And as you uh, sure uh, know that, um, well, we don't know how far and how long this is going to be. Uh, well, as, uh, as actually I said, I have a particular interest now being kind of uh, the fall of my life. I'm uh, looking back and see how many different things I have been doing and that uh, uh, the only way forward is to make sense of all these different things, integrate different uh, activities into something 
that uh, is perhaps of interest to other people. I'm delighted to be here and my primary goal is to understand better and to uh, uh, exchange few views about uh, how do we solve all these separate activities from care, cure and others. And I have prepared just a few slides to initiate discussion and um, let's hope that we get somewhere uh, with, uh, uh, with these things. <clears throat> well, let's first uh, recall what we actually talk uh, about is what uh, in the Western world it's called medicine. And of course, this has spread as a word and practice to other places. So the question is, is medicine science? And I understand that most of you are doing science, different types of science, or is it an art or is something else? And this William Osler, whom some of you know, is a very famous Megillian who is father of modern medicine, who pointed out that variability among individuals uh, makes it impossible to be a science but it is not an art. And uh, what I like is what Catherine Montgomery has uh, described in her books, how doctors think, which I highly recommend. Medicine is practice. Medicine is, uh, uh, of course, uh, today based on uh, use of basic science, but certainly it is not science and I hope that uh, you don't want to be or are not going to practice having uh, uh, renaming your patients as your customer or your object or studies. Uh, this will come out perhaps a little bit later. Now we do recognize that medicine is based on scientific uh, advances which we use to understand, design treatment, treat and follow up. And one of the big news in the last 20, 30 years is a genome that has uh, been promised 2001 and before as a new breakthrough in understanding us human beings. Uh, this has been one of the big, um, shall we say, misunderstanding of genome. And uh, what we now recognize that the genes are just part of a big network, uh, which contains all the other elements. And that um, to understand this uh, catalog of our characteristics, we actually have to understand that uh, gene is a data, genes are database, and that the genome is an organ of the cell, cells, like uh, Margaret uh, Clinton, uh, Mick Clinton, uh, Nobel Prize winner, uh, proposed. So we need new models to see how this whole big uh, system works. So we have systems medicine that. Um, uh, uh, helps us to deal with uh, a multitude of different factors. We also recognize that this could be understood as a network and network medicine is a big growing discipline. And one particular interesting aspect is evolutionary medicine, uh, which is not a new, shall we say, way of treatment, but it's a way of looking at patient as product of evolution and not of yesterday's influence uh, on uh, uh, patient's health. I'm not sure if this is going to be clear all the way to the end, but uh, uh, let's uh, first uh, deal with the very important thing that um, uh, there is a big misunderstanding what genes are. There are at least two types of concepts. One is, uh, uh, the uh, molecular biological notion of gene as a DNA sequence. Um, and there is another one which has come to us through studies as simple and as far reaching as Gregor Mendel's observation of characteristics of inheritance of different 
um, shall we say, uh, characteristic of the peas that he has studied. This picture shows the complexity of this uh, uh, environment. Uh, DNA does not have any direct control over phenotype. It is done through a biological network, set of biological networks, which is really uh, complex and which we are trying to study. This uh, biological network is, of course, influenced by DNA. DNA is part of it, but also is influenced by environment. And one very important uh, aspect of this interaction is epigenetics which is uh, um, really changing how we see ourselves within the world and shall we say within the environment. Now, uh, enough said. Uh, so there's no place here for selfish gene because genes are not active ingredients. They are just database and a passive catalog of our characteristics. Uh, what has happened after a genome was discovered that all the promises that diseases, human diseases will be now unraveled because we now know what we are, supposedly genes uh, are making us. Well, that fell true because essentially, except few uh, cases, uh, most of the interaction uh, or well, most of the influence of different genes is polygenetic. There's, there are very few diseases that are linked to one identified gene. Uh, just to illustrate how the difference between inheritance and gene works, we know that uh, height appears in families and that uh, the, the height of families are uh, inherited. However, when we look at the genes, only 15% of the uh, difference in height is explainable by genes, so to speak, okay. Now, uh, medicine is really continuously uh, developing along with the different types of technology. And today, we recognize that there are a number of factors that fuel, fuel current transformation of medicine or biomedicine. It is clear that uh, biomedicine is increasingly inundated with data, with information. Um, just to illustrate one example from pharmaceutical industry, where test is the essence of understanding how uh, drug potential uh, molecules work. Uh, only 15, 20 years ago, a typical pharmaceutical company uh, produced about a couple hundred thousand data points a year. Now, this is a couple hundred of millions of data points. Now, this really puts a great uh, deal of emphasis on data with difficulties. How do we analyze this data? So, this emerging technologies. Um, have to create a new patient data space and analytical technology are heavily now uh, mathematical and computational that uh, we often uh, have to start thinking and where is the patient here and that's one of the central issues here that on one hand we have a push from technology and on the other hand the patient is disappearing somewhere in this whole uh, forest of different things. That's why many people say that uh, we have to think about uh, medical practice in a different way. It is uh, one of these ideas that uh, practice has to be predictive, preventive, participatory, and personalized. And I'm personally very keen to study personalized medicine as one of the branch of gen post-genomic world, because unlike all the other things that uh, post-genomic or genomic era promised, 
uh, like the resolution of different diseases, understanding of different diseases, in the area of uh, pharmacogenomics, there is a very straight and re really uh, uh, obvious or uh, impact of knowing um, uh, molecular structure of uh, or, or polymorphism of enzymes that uh, metabolize uh, drugs and the uh, effect of this polymorphism on what happens to a drug in the body of person with such and such uh, per, uh, isoform of a P450 enzyme. So that's one area where really uh, pharmacogenomics contributed directly and uh, very substantially. Now, <clears throat> we could also talk about frameworks of biomedicine. We talk about um, universal models of disease. We talked already personal in medicine. We also um, could use all this knowledge of different details to uh, which we could call as precision medicine in which all the molecular uh, uh, understanding of molecular sequences, uh, phenotyping and uh, uh, all other aspects of our uh, let's say uh, biology, uh, we could use to uh, produce a personalized response to some problems that patients have. We're trying to put patient back together by put, taking him apart by all this analytical method. Okay, now healthcare system is uh, one of the mechanisms by which we supposedly deliver health to the population. Now, what does that mean? Uh, we have to, we could use this uh, uh, diagram by Globerman and Minsberg. Uh, Minsberg is a professor at McGill and a big guru of uh, healthcare management. And we could see that there are four different areas, uh, quadrants, uh, community, cure, care, uh, cure being doctors, care primarily nurses, and then control, which is managers. And what uh, we're going to go through is to several um, ideas that uh, Henry Minsberg and his team are trying to uh, illuminate by um, sort of uh, correcting some of our pre-conceived uh, notions about how the system should work. So we have gone from discussion of biomedicine to discussion of how the, we deliver this knowledge to the, let's say, community. And uh, that's another view of the whole thing, um, four quadrants. Um, here is uh, uh, again uh, clear that we have public control, that we have community care and acute care. And uh, of course, we try to involve the uh, community. This is where different, shall we say, aspects of communal understanding of themselves are exemplified and could be uh, helpful in solving this big riddle. Now, the problem that uh, you hear always is that um, the healthcare systems are failing. Well, when we look a little bit around ourselves, that's what uh, everybody says when they have to wait three hours to a medical appointment or when they cannot even find uh, general practitioners. The problem is that the uh, system is not failing. It is just uh, um, uh, uh, becoming more and more complex and more and more expensive because new technologies produce new expenses. They also have these great side effects that they differ start differentiating between patient groups, those that could afford it and those that could not afford it. That's a 
just the tip of the iceberg that I have touched by looking at this aspect of healthcare, and that is the um, influence of technology. And of course, question is, if you don't have it, how would you say, where is the answer? Uh, and the answer could be that uh, we could still do things without having the latest technology. And often it is said, uh, the last 5% of improvement cost uh, far more than all this other 90%. And that's a question, could we afford it? Could we afford, I mean, just think about the following. PET scan is a great uh, technology that could identify all sorts of things in the live human, but would every regional, every local hospital have to have PET scan that cost enormous amount of money and in, involves a lot of technology from cyclotron producing uh, isotopes to all kinds of other things. So we clearly have come to the point where we have to examine, is this the way forward? Now, uh, Henry Mintzberg is uh, really one person that understand um, um, healthcare management. And it's one of those that uh, people say, uh, if there are hundred, if there are 10 people in management, that we should listen to in the last hundred years. He's one of them. He's professor at McGill University. And I was fortunate to, at some point, uh, uh, I went to China to try to, um, on the invitation, uh, to see if uh, some of the wisdom from our environment could be used to uh, organize massive training of uh, healthcare administrators in China in collaboration with one major university. Well, it never happened, but I learned that um, uh, rationality is not always uh, what motivates us in solving the problem. Now, here's what uh, uh, Henry Mintzberg proposes or, or uh, uh, identifies as typical mythology in terms of uh, um, healthcare. Uh, my pictures have changed. Are we still all right? Am I talking all right? Yes, absolutely. Everything is okay. fine. Okay. Thank. So uh, let's go through this uh, list of uh, uh, myths. In fact, uh, I just recently had to reorder my book, and this is the book that he has written managing the knit of healthcare because the copy that I have is in my office. And since 15th of March this year, <laughs> our university is closed and it's a big hassle to get into my office. In any case, let's go through this thing. So I already mentioned the myth one, the healthcare system is failing. No, it is succeeding very expensively. Uh, the healthcare system can be fixed by clever social engineering. Here's the big, big issue for at least our system, but I'm sure it is also happening in every other country, and in particular in big countries like India, where there is a, a great number of practitioners, shall we say, in trenches, and where people on top constantly manage uh, the system with all kinds of abstractions. And, uh, you know, every year there is a, a new flavor of what has to be done uh, uh, and what how to change the system. Nobody listens to the people in trenches where there are really the, the most, um, that are affected by all this uh, um, modification of the systems, but they also know what they need. So mid three, uh, healthcare institution, as well as the overall system can be fixed by bringing in the heroic leaders. This is one of the 
terrible mistakes, we already see what heroic leaders mean in business, where they command huge bonuses. Uh, but uh, do they really, are they really worth all that? Or they just load uh, their pockets and uh, let the system go? Uh, that definitely is a bad model for the healthcare. Healthcare can be fixed by treating it more as a business. This is one more fallacy and it's popular in USA. Uh, result is that USA healthcare system is the most expensive in the world. It can do the top of the things, but it is not accessible to a whole section of the population. Just to compare, administrative cost of USA system, healthcare system is 31%. In Canada, it's 17%. In other countries, it's even less. So no scratch it, could not be business. Uh, very important thing, when I started medicine, the primary drive of all of us, I would say, uh, uh, that enter is that Medicine is not a job, it is a vocation, it is calling. You do it not because you're going to have easy life, but that you really can change your environment. Now, this is not something like competitive business. It's something that really requires uh, uh, to focus on the end results, improvement of health of uh, your population. Now, <clears throat> another myth, and I'm stopping with the whole list of other myth, mythologies here, is that uh, healthcare is rightly left to the private sector for the sake of efficiency. This is another US, uh, um, uh, shall we say, uh, vision of uh, many people in USA that all you have to uh, do is give it to private sector with its competition and all the other things that uh, this type of uh, with which private uh, sector um, work with and it will be more efficient and will be cheaper and will actually work at the expense of helping the population um, we do recognize that all sectors have a role in healthcare management. Now, out of all this, let's think about what Minsberg, and I'm going to just uh, very briefly go through what he considers that we need to do, reframing different aspects of healthcare. Man we have to reframe management, um, not to manage it from the top, like refraining strategy, not planning from the top. It has to be, um, we have to listen to the people on the front line. Uh, one other aspect that is clearly crucial and that we have to change the culture from competition to collaboration. This is one aspect of uh, shall we say, worldview, which I'm particularly keen to propagate, not only in the healthcare, but in the science. And uh, I'm not sure how many of you have read, in April 2014, four members of National Academy of Science in the States have uh, written an article, you could find it out, it's a 14th of April 2014, uh, Varmus, Kirchner, Alberts, and the fourth person, I forgot the name, who have uh, warned, wrote, have written an article which is alerting uh, scientists uh, and scientific community in the States, in the world, how things in the science in the States are going the wrong way. And what they particularly uh, identified as a uh, wrong way is hyper competition, hyper competitiveness that characterizes 
uh, U.S. science, which all stems from this idea that business practices are really good for research environment. I let you think, and uh, I would say you would probably agree because they, in fact, say we have to change. Uh, there are a number of propositions they had uh, mentioned. One that is missing, which I'm actually, this is one of my current project, is to bring to research education, uh, research practice, a better understanding of what does it mean, uh, science. This comes, of course, not from uh, navel gazing of scientists, but from other uh, domains of uh, human endeavor. Uh, one of them is philosophy and sociology of science. And I have a project which is uh, <clears throat> slowly emerging because it is against certain entrenched beliefs in scientific community that, you know, people in humanities and social studies, they actually are either against science or they really don't understand science. How could they tell us what to do? Well, in essence, um, that just re identifies that theoretical understanding or the understanding of theory of what we do in research is very poor. Okay, let's move on. Um, uh, this is an issue reframing scale. Um, uh, economy, uh, let's go on. I, I think that I have to shorten because I'm taking too much of your time. Um, the reframing management, managing style is uh, that we have to put emphasis on caring more than curing. That really is um, one aspect of medical system that puts nursing in the focus which is terribly neglected in our environment. I have no clue how that will look like in, uh, um, in India. I know that in some parts of, your, of the world, like uh, Africa, uh, nursing staff is as important, if not more important than uh, uh, just because there are not enough physicians. And uh, one very important thing that we have to keep in mind that healthcare is a system that is beyond its parts. It is not a collection of parts. It has to work together. And there's this uh, interesting uh, metaphorical view uh, which says, why can't healthcare work like a cow? Why can it not be a true system of cooperation and collaboration? Note that the parts of a cow are not seamless. They are distinct, necessarily so. But in a healthy cow, they work together harmoniously. Can this happen in healthcare uh, system? Uh, I think that uh, we have uh, better finish here um, by essentially summarizing um, uh, the gap issue, which means how to bring the administration of healthcare closer to the operations. Collaboration issue, how to get the different parts of healthcare working in greater cooperative harmony. And that includes science. And we didn't even touch one aspect, which is knowledge translation. One of the topics that I, I'm particularly keen in, as an object of studies and an object of practice and propagation. Why? Because this is one which uh, has been seen as a major obstacle in, let's say, one industry, and that's only one, and that is uh, production of new treatments. Uh, often in uh, the in the pharmaceutical industry, if uh, you look at the failures of drug when they come out in the first um, examination in patients that fail, they fail. Then what is the major reason for failure? 
lack of efficacy. Why? Well, uh, one of the very obvious reason is that the whole examination of potential of a particular uh, molecule as a, a treatment option has been done on the wrong model. Uh, very often, uh, researchers in the, on the bench side forget that there is no such thing as the animal model of human disease. And often they choose something that seemingly would answer the question, is this molecule going to work, uh, alleviating a certain problem, without really understanding that this particular version of problem in an animal has no link with the problem in the human. Uh, that's a long story, and I'm just shortening it here. The knowledge translation uh, is uh, wrongly set on from bench to bedside, where the problem are primarily, uh, or not primarily, largely, uh, uh, a flow of understanding of human pathology to the bench side. Um, well, uh, next engagement issue, uh, we discussed about uh, human scale that has to go beyond economic scale. How do we do this? That's a big problem. And uh, we already said this has to go back to the trenches where people that uh, deal with daily in managing patients, managing all aspects of healthcare from uh, uh, drug delivery, when do you use the drug, when you don't use the drug, uh, guidelines that are produced uh, by uh, often uh, groups of experts who are uh, really uh, in the pay on the pay of some interest group and so forth. This is another aspect of knowledge translation which I uh, don't have time to go into, and that is how. Um, deleterious or pernicious uh, industry producing drugs can be on the medical practice and research because they are responsible to their shareholders and their idea of patient is a customer from which we could extract as much money as we can. They used to produce blockbuster drugs. Then they were told that's no good. Now they have switched to a new uh, mode and that is called niche busters, which means uh, drugs for very few patients, rare diseases who would pay the same amount total as the number of uh, patients that used to buy blockbuster drugs. In any case, that area of um, biomedical system needs a lot of cleaning, and it is one that is hard to see how would it work if it's entirely driven by private interest. We now know that in uh, uh, many areas where a uh, uh, large number of people are affected, but not in the Western world, there's very little development going on purely because industry recognizes there is not much money extracting uh, from poor people in the world. A typical case, it's uh, uh, diseases that take a great deal of efforts and cost, uh, infectious diseases um, like TB, uh, for which we spend minimal amount of money to develop new treatments, and there are certainly needed. So that's a sector issue and performance issue. How to balance the intrinsic needs for efficiency, quality, quality in healthcare? Well, uh, that's a big topic, which uh, I think I touched here and there. And I think I would uh, have to finish before you close your Zooms and say that's m too much. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, let me uh, just scare you that um, uh, uh, one big uh, problem is that people are uh, 
kind of impressed by really top medicine that is available in the United States. However, they don't have a healthcare system. They have a disease management system and we don't want to have that in our yards. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, Andre, and, for a very, very comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, would you mind uh, unsharing your slides so we can see you in full view and maybe sure. spend, if you have sure. time, two, three questions? Yes. So from the last slide, it appears that you are advocating a socially, a social kind of a system versus a capitalist uh, private can you? Uh, just a sec. I, I have to figure how to. Uh... <laughs> it's done. It's done. Oh, it is? Yes, it is fine. Okay, good, good. Okay. Well, uh, I am saying, and I said in, the, in one of my slides, that uh, both private and public system uh, works. In fact, even in the States, the best systems like Mayo Clinic. As, have you heard of Mayo Clinic? Yes. It's an amazing place where the best medicine is practiced and it's cheaper than all the other big systems. Kaiser Permanente is also one of the things. Why? They are not owned by business. They're a public group not owned by anybody. And they dedicate their knowledge, their practice, their uh, efforts to the patient. Now, uh, we have to immediately say that um, we shouldn't really talk about US system as a template for a solution because every other country, developed country works uh, differently and they're much more efficient and much cheaper, including Canadian system. So yes, I'm very much advocate of one principle, and this is the philosophical issue here. What is health? Is this a commodity or a public good? What public do you think? Good. I think public good. Yes, but that's not how it is practiced in the United States. It's a commodity. That's why every and new advancement and that new technology. The, and there are, exactly. And there are so uh, it's almost like gun control, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's no discussion. Yeah. And anytime you, there are uh, clever people writing about the danger that the government takes control of healthcare as the worst thing that could happen. Well, look at Germany, look at France, look at Sweden, look at Canada. It's uh, not government that controls it. It's a public interest through some, uh, of course, regulatory mechanisms that are done by governments. Now, uh, I understand that uh, in India, there is a similar attitude. There is a large private practice, but there's also a sense of public responsibility. And I think some mixture of these two is necessary. Uh, for example, you have not been in Montreal since our new big super hospital was built, which was uh, created by fusing five McGill hospitals in one big structure. It's big. Uh, nurses said we need a, a, a bicycle to go from one end to the other. Um, but uh, it is uh, public. It is owned by McGill, but it is public. And it was created by a public private uh, foundation. Now it works until somebody says, we can't afford it. <laughs> And one way do you see it is that in the corridors there are of the hospital that's really well designed and beautiful. I love it. I work there uh, also and teach in the research institute. There's a big research institute attached. Uh, is the following that uh, 
corporation that runs this, which is public and private, uh, has put such a high price on boots for the stores that half of the boots are empty five years after it was open. It's too expensive. Mm -hmm. In India, we have a new uh, national education policy that advocates the inclusion of the ancient Ayurveda and the yoga system into a preventive uh, fashion with the modern medicine. So as you would agree, about 60 to 70 percent of the diseases are lifestyle disorders, non-communicable, and they are preventable. And if you, so India is actually coming up with 150,000 wellness centers, and they'll be having a component, about 10% of them, uh, a preventive Ayurveda fashion, uh, fa uh, you know, fashion by the Ayurveda mm -hmm. uh, mechanism of healing or the prevention of the disease or a holistic healing, mm -hmm. and the yoga and the, you know, mind body connection based uh, exercises which are called yoga into those wellness centers and there's a lot of talk of uh, the primary medical education incorporating these alternative systems at least based on evidence at least for those aspects that have evidence i think that this is one very important aspect of progression of our medical systems that it sh should have this cultural sensitivity uh, but that we all recognize across the board in all of the, let's say, contemporary world, that certain views which come from show me that this is true, evidence-based, is somehow a controlling mechanism. Now here, I have to say that evidence is not easy to get. And you could see that every once in a while evidence meaning truth is changing why because a new study was done which overcame some of the confounding factors of the previous studies and said no we actually have to do this to... so in in some sense this is where the problems are right now by the way i have not shown one uh, set of slides of which I'm uh, of one of my projects that I'm uh, interested now. And that is, <clears throat> uh, you know what pathogenesis is, right? Yeah. We know pathological factors that uh, lead to some pathology that's called pathogenesis. But there is another way of looking at uh, the situation and say, and what are the factors that contribute to health? It's called salutogenesis. Yes. And that's something that uh, I think is missing in today's understanding. You mentioned prevention. We know that prevention, preventive medicine is cheaper than therapeutic. We don't do it. Why? Because we are not rational. And we have, not that we are not rational, there are all kinds of factors of which I have mentioned yes. some that muddy the water and that we have well let let's uh, bring in one which is called vaccination mm -hmm. you know in the western world there is a whole movement anti-vaxxers yeah i've heard of that. that invented all sorts of irrational reasons why not and yet this is one of the biggest successes of medicine vaccination against smallpox is has removed one terrible medical problem from our world and essentially or or uh, poliomyelitis as well the polio was eradicated because of vaccination so the people who had, who say that there is should should be no vaccination should also advocate that we should take minimal drugs and uh, take wellness approach, preventive prevention approach? They should, but because the whole approach is irrational, don't try to find that they are connecting uh, rational and irrational things, right? Yeah. And in some aspects, you are familiar with the publication in Lancet about 10 years ago, in which one physician linked all kinds of side effects of vaccination 
and uh, which was later found to be false. He's now in jail for propagating falsehood. That gave the fuel to all these people, anti-vaxxers. Oh. Um, so where is the solution here? Education. Education, yes. But you know who has to be educated first? The kids in the schools. No. The policymakers. That's right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is what the problem is, right? And also scientists, scientists. practitioners. This is, yeah. I told you, I have this project which is slowly emerging, and that is to give some theoretical background to graduate students and postdocs. I call it uh, to paraphrase another uh, project, another program uh, in many places. It's a scientist's understanding of science, mm -hmm. which is actually very poor. Yeah. Uh, two examples. Everybody has this idea, oh, hypothesis and solving it, right? Yeah. You are familiar with um, Hubel and Wiesel, Nobel Prize winners. Mm -hmm. Uh, one is McGill Guy Hubel, and Weasel was for many years president of Ebro. Oh, really? Yes, and uh, he's still alive. Hubel died a few years ago, and uh, it was interesting. They written, they have written a book, which is autobiography, uh, having uh, all major articles preceded by how they came to the to do this type of things. And on page 192 on the right top paragraph, they state, in all of our research, we rarely, if ever, you use a hypothesis. <laughs> so how come? Uh, I interviewed, you know what who Brenda Milner is? Yes, yeah, she was another another Nobel laureate. No, she didn't get a Nobel Prize. Uh, she is uh, now 102 years old. And 10 years ago, I interviewed her for Ebro, Women in World uh, Neuroscience. And spontaneously, in the middle of this, uh, what was supposed to be 15 minutes interview, and it turned up hundred and one hour and a half. <laughs> yeah. Look, you can complete with Brenda Milner's interview and the outcome. Yes, that's right. That she actually said, you know, Ante, in my research, I have never used any hypothesis. Now, I'm illustrating this, that for a typical reviewer of grants, if you don't have hypothesis, you don't do science, right? Correct. How come? If you want to get Nobel Prize, you don't need hypothesis. <laughs> <laughs> That's, of course, very simplified, a very much simplified view, but it demonstrates, I believe, this need to understand how science actually functions. Because if you look, what do we do? We finish uh, whatever pre uh, studies we had, then we enter in some lab. And we do by rot what is going on in that lab. How many labs practice meditation about science as you do it right now? We had a we had an internet problem, so I missed you what you said. But I agree that uh, the hypothesis free research is rolling on, and maybe it has the serendipitous component and a solution. Uh, problem solving component, which is not. Well, uh, uh, let, let's not uh, misunderstand uh, what I'm trying to say. Uh, Darwin did some experiments, but all that he did was observe. Mm. So there are different ways of discovering different things. If you want to use an expensive machine without, without having a plan what you're going to do, which means you have some question that you test, you will not go far. 
You don't go into a lab without having an idea yes. that you want to examine such and such thing. Yes. Question is how um, that this is not the only thing. All the molecular biology and genomics was essentially um, collection, collecting stamp collection from which suddenly something emerged. So there are different ways of looking at it. I didn't talk about um, a big issue of what, has, what is knowledge? We are scientists and we produce knowledge. What is knowledge? Does any scientist know what knowledge is? Where is knowledge? Where does knowledge exist? In, in books? Book, in books? In no, brain. not at all. In There's brain. no knowledge in the books. Mm -hmm. That is information, compilation. Exactly, exactly. Uh, knowledge is what we make out of information. Okay. Now, I uh, didn't talk about that there are at least two types of knowledge. One is explicit, which means we could structure it. This is what I did uh, uh, last half an hour. Actually, I really exhausted my time. It's now yes, I, we're going to catch up on the 24th. Uh, the viewers may not be. Uh, Dr. Ante Pajan has agreed to be with us 24th at 6 p.m. But this was a great conversation. I had a question about when you questioned the uh, need for, or you rather dismissed the importance of a hero for bringing the change in the healthcare system. But we'll take that up on the 24th. Really, we have overshot our time. So uh, let's, uh, if you have any final comment to make, then we can otherwise close. Well, I came to learn. So I need your questions and your comments. My uh, big uh, hall in this whole dialogue is that I know very little about Ayurveda. I had a great friend, uh, Daya Varma, one who is a Lucknow graduate. We spent 40 years at, in the same department and he has written a book about this healing through Ayurveda and, and modern medicine. He published it and I wanted to consult it, but it's in my office and my office is off limits. So I couldn't. You're doing a lot of work on Ayurveda, memory enhancement to um, reduction in BMI, uh, control of diabetes using evolving yoga protocols, which is not, not just an exercise, a misbelief in the people and many, many scientists. So we're also doing multi-centric randomized control trials in, in uh, captive populations such as prisons or retreats to a high altitude, giving them a challenge and seeing how we can rescue them mm -hmm. in PO2 levels, also relevant to the the COVID pandemic where the PO2 levels fall down, short protocols to long to frequent, varying the frequency. And, uh, you know, we're basically uh, trying to do our CTs. Because, but you're right, the, it's difficult to generate evidence unless there is a system where you can uh, subject the patient flow into an on one trial automatically without much hindrance of the ethical committees, then only the evidence will emerge what is called as the comparative effectiveness trials. What is uh, uh, cortisol, uh, cort uh, steroid doing versus what is our Indian herb ashwagandha doing or uh, Singh doing? Yeah, you mentioned if we avoid ethical committee. Well, I could tell you that uh, this is a different view. Uh, we recognize that there was so much abuse without supervision of a group of people that have only one interest, minimize or eliminate harm from studies that may occur to the subject, to patient. And this is one thing that we don't give up. Why? Because history of tests without control are horrendous. Sure. So we have to be aware of that. Of course, the, the ethical committees are extremely important. But uh, a system where uh, the alternative practitioners may be as faculty, for example, in McGill, where half the patient with epilepsy go undergo a carbamazepine dose versus the other half, uh, of, that, of course, after ethical committee approvals undergo a different. Yeah. Dose. And we have a comparative effectiveness uh, efficacy testing. And of course, it goes through the safety and other 
Please. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Then we agree. Uh, by the way, you remember that uh, uh, I'm actually part of a group that's called Whole uh, Person Care, which uh, practices mindfulness. One of the young ladies with whom I worked 20 years ago <clears throat> in alcoholism, she is one of those that spent two, three years in India learning uh, Indian ways of meditation and mindfulness. And that's a very strong program. I'm yeah. trying to put in the music because they don't have music in this whole program. And music is a tremendously important thing in our lives. Music is uh, very, very important. In fact, music is uh, the classical Indian music. And for that matter, classical music of any country is folk music. Yes. Well, it's very important. And in the mindfulness program or what is called the yoga, there is a chanting of uh, certain shlokas or phrases. Yes, uh, yes. You have a component called Om, and they say it in a different way. It's quite musical. And that aspect is, I think you're right, uh, it's, it has to be enhanced and uh, integrated in a more structured fashion. So that it becomes more joyful. It is otherwise a very nice uh, experience if you undergo yoga or a mindfulness program through a, a, a yoga instructor or mm -hmm. a, a teacher you know who's uh, trained and qualified then you can actually know the real essence and the benefits of mm -hmm. yoga and doing it regularly and uh, also then the ayurveda that you just mentioned talks about uh, clinical uh, division of individuals on the basis of some psychometric traits and then they customize yoga or the treatment according to those traits and that's all written out thousands of years back Right. And I think it would be cost effective if we could generate evidence through RCTs or N on one trials and test them in uh, after regulatory approvals to a certain NCD and see if uh, it can be cost effective, preventable, and can be expanded and scaled for the community benefit. And that's what you want. Well, you know, a thousand years of empirical understanding is great value. Yeah. what we have to learn how to extract what can be uh, shall we say verified and produced in the modern world and i think that uh, I, i'm sure that there are hidden fortunes uh, fortunes not in money but mm -hmm. in uh, <laughs> in wisdom in all of these things well let me finish by one very important aspect which uh, <clears throat> Actually, I think, were you at the conference of dementia in Nairobi when I was lecturing about music yes, in Raj, the dementia? I organized it in Brown. Richard. Yes, that's right. Brown. And, and uh, are we alone now? Actually, I can. we can say bye to everybody and we can talk for four, five, six, ten minutes, whatever. Yeah, good. Sure, thank I, you very much. This uh, went on for beyond the framework of uh, 20 minutes that I think I, we were enjoying. The, I'm, I'm sure you also enjoyed uh, interacting and knowing a little bit more about Ante. He's a great human being, a, a prolific scientist and one of the best educators I met in neuroscience and otherwise can talk to him about philosophy, neuroscience, molecular biology, pharmacology, administration, management, spiritual, anything under sky. So we will thank you for your uh, patience and please give your feedbacks. The link for the recorded version would be available. And uh, you can go back and check the entire series of conversations. We are probably approaching 500 videos with 150 days of uninterrupted, continuous integrative health education series. Thank you very much for joining, joining us. Thank you, Ante, for joining us. And you stay here and I'll just close the live session. Thank you, Akshay, for inviting me. It was great pleasure to meet you again and to continue meeting you. Yeah, thank All you. All right, we stay. Thank yeah. you.